now turn to part one. Part one. Listen to the conversation between Fred and Mary, who are talking about a farewell party, and answer questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Mary, thank God you're here. We've a ton of work to do if we're going to get everything ready for tonight. Whose idea was it to have this going away party for Christ anyway? It was your idea, Fred. Remember. Hey, I suggested a small get together for a few close friends. I didn't mean inviting half the university. Well, it's too late now. We have about three hours to get everything under control. Have you got that list of things we need to do? Yeah, it's in my room. Hang on, I'll go get it. Hell, I can't find it. What do you mean you can't find it? I can't find it. What do you think I mean? Damn! I remember I left it in the library. Okay, okay, cool down. We'll manage. I can remember what's on it. Let's check the food and drink situation. Did you arrange the beer? Yeah, Jim said he'd bring ten cases of cold Budweiser, ice, and a couple of big bins to keep it cold. Says he'll get here around five. Ah,、huh, you know, Jim. He'll probably turn up drunk around midnight. No problem. I phoned him a few minutes ago. He's at Jenny's place. She's keeping him away from alcohol until he's delivered everything safe and sound. What about the wine? You said you'd look after it. Oh my God! I completely forgot. What's the time? Half past three. Okay, I'll go to the liquor store and sort it out. Will they deliver? No problem. But you'll have to pay up front. I reckon about sixty people will turn up. Allow for half a bottle per person. That makes thirty bottles, half red, half white. What do you think? That、nah, should be enough. Better to have too much than too little. Why not make it forty? Twenty-five red and fifteen white. As the conversation continues, answer questions five to ten. Yeah, I guess most people prefer red. Where's the nearest liquor store? Not far. Go out the front door, turn right. Sorry, left. Take the second street on your right, and it's three hundred yards down on the left, just before you get to the park. Okay, I'll go in a few minutes. Let's first make a quick list to make sure we haven't forgotten anything. Glasses, glasses. What about glasses? Sally borrowed a hundred beer glasses and a hundred wine glasses from the student bar. They're in the cupboard. Should be enough. Yeah, should be. What about the barbecue? I've got two barbecues and plenty of charcoal out the back. And Jane and I spent three hours yesterday getting the steaks, chicken legs, and sausages ready. They're all in the big fridge. Should taste terrific. Tons of garlic, pepper, and soy sauce. No MSG. Sounds good. What about plates and things? Sally has looked after that as well. She's borrowed them from the bar too. They're in the cupboard with the glasses. You know, Sally refuses to use throwaway things. Bad for the environment. Good for her. Oh, just remembered. 
Could you pick up another twenty loaves of French bread and a few packets of paper napkins? No problem. Is there a shop on the way? There's a supermarket just before you get to the liquor store. Can you manage everything, or should I go with you? I'll manage. I've got this huge rucksack. No problem. Damn! Just remembered. I'm over my limit on my credit card. Have you got five hundred dollars on you? We'll work out who owes who how much later. No problem. I took out a thousand dollars this morning. Here's five hundred. Ta. Okay, I'll get going. I'll see you in a while. Ciao. See you. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You are going to hear a talk by Richard Thomas, who is the head of the chemistry department of a college. He is going to give a brief introduction of the college, and you must answer questions according to what you hear. Now, first look at questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Royal Hospital College. What a beautiful September day you've brought with you! My name is Richard Thomas. I'm the head of the chemistry department, and today it's my pleasure to introduce our wonderful college to you. Normally, the dean, Professor John Thomas, yes, we share the same surname, likes to do this, but unfortunately, he has a bad case of flu. So he is doing the sensible thing and staying in bed. He sends his apologies, but you'll be meeting him soon, so no big problem. I'm sure you are all so excited at the thought of studying here that you have read all about the history of our school. But for those who haven't, I'll give you a brief summary as we walk around. The college was originally founded in anybody know? Yes. 1694 by William and Mary of Orange. Can you remember your high school history? Right, William of Orange was a Dutch prince married to King James the Second's eldest daughter Mary. 1694. Poor Queen Mary died of smallpox the same year. Actually, the school was not a school in those days. It was a hospital for retired sailors of the Royal Navy. And it wasn't here in the beautiful countryside of East England. It was located in what is now East London on the banks of the River Thames. Back in those days, it was also in the countryside. But London grew and grew, and by the end of the nineteenth century, it was surrounded by houses and smoky factories. So, after the Second World War, a New Zealand millionaire named Sir Gifford Reid. Kindly gave the school sixty-five million pounds to move to here. 
He was an architect, and he designed much of the beautiful school that you see today. It opened in 1933, and if you look to your right, there is a statue of Sir Gifford Reed facing that other large statue of Queen Victoria. As the talk is going on, answer the questions 16 to 20. Okay, let's jump back to the 1700s. In the 1780s, the Royal Hospital was changed into a school for the orphans of officers and men of the Royal Navy, and they added the word college to the name. For nearly a hundred years, it was coeducational, but in 1868, the Board of Governors decided to make it boys only. Much more boring, don't you think? And it stayed that way right up until 1991, when the school became coeducational again. Okay, and here we are at the school church. Do we have any musicians with us? You? Wonderful. What do you play? Piano and organ. Oh, you'll love it here. Our church has the largest organ in England, and we often have recording companies, the BBC, etc., coming here to record and our staff and students are more than welcome to play it. In fact, there's a waiting list. It's very popular. In fact, the school is very well known for its choir and orchestra. I sing in the choir, and last summer we toured North America. Great fun. A healthy mind in a healthy body, as the Romans used to say. Which brings us to our gym and swimming pool. Both are open from six in the morning till eleven at night, seven days a week. The gym has everything you need for aerobics, weight training, martial arts, basketball, gymnastics, and even an indoor running track. So there's no excuse for not keeping fit. And of course, we have all the usual team sports, soccer, basketball. Our women's basketball team won the All England Universities Championship this year. Rugby, water polo, no American football. So you see, we are quite a sporty lot here. And we also study sometimes. Here's the main library. I'm afraid we can't go in because it's being redecorated. It's supposed to open again this Wednesday, but it looks to me that it'll be a bit late. And here's the coffee shop. Why don't we stop here for a drink? Agree? Jolly good. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a man inquiring about college courses. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi, can I help you? I was told to come here because I'd like to talk to someone about taking a management course. Right, I'm one of the tutors, so I should be able to help you. Oh, good.、Uh, my name's Brian Ardley. I've decided to enrol on a part-time management course. A friend of mine took one last year and recommended it to me. Right. Is there anything I should do before the course, like? Reading or anything. We prefer to integrate reading with the course, so we don't give out a reading list in advance. But we like people to write a case study describing an organisation they know. I've already done that, as my friend told me you wanted one. But would it be possible to sit in on a teaching session to see what it's like? I haven't been a student for quite a while. Fine. Just let me know which date, and I'll arrange it with the tutor. Now, could I ask you about the college facilities, please? Anything in particular? Well, the course is one day a week, all day, isn't it? So presumably it's possible to buy food. Yes, the refectory is open all day. Does it cater for special diets? I have some food allergies. Provided you warn the refectory in advance, it won't be a problem. Good. What about facilities for young children? I'd like to bring my daughter here while I'm studying. How old is she? Three. Then she is eligible to join the nursery, which is supervised by a qualified nursery nurse. The waiting list for a place is quite long, though, so you ought to apply now. Okay. I don't know if our careers advice service would be of any interest to you. Yes, it might help me decide how to develop my career after the course. The centre has a lot of reference materials and staff qualified to give guidance on a one-to-one -one basis. I noticed a fitness centre next to the college. Is that for students? It's open to everyone, but students pay an annual fee that's much less than the general public pay. And presumably, the college library stocks newspapers and journals as well as books. Yes, and there's also an audio-visual room for viewing and listening to videos, cassettes, and so on. Is there also access to computers? Yes, your tutor will need to arrange with a technical support team for you to get a password. So ask him or her about it when you start the course. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen. And answer questions twenty-six to thirty. By the way, do you know about our business centre? No. What's that? It's a training resource, a collection of materials for people to study on their own or use in their own organisations. Uh huh. You mean books and videos? Yes, and manuals for self-study, plus a lot of computer-based materials so people can work through them at their own speed and repeat anything they aren't sure about. And you can hire laptops to use in your own home or workplace, as well as printers that you can take away. Does it have anything that I could use to improve my study skills? I don't have much idea about report writing, and I'm sure I'll need it on the course. Oh yes, there's plenty of useful material. Just ask one of the staff. Does the centre cover all the main areas of business? Yes, topics like finance and, of course, marketing. That's a popular one. Local managers seem to queue up to borrow the videos. So it isn't just for students then? No, it's for members only, but anyone can join. How much does it cost? A hundred pounds a year for a company and fifty pounds for an individual, with no discount for students. I'm afraid. Well, that's very helpful. Well, I think that's all. I'd better go home and fill in the enrolment form. Thanks for all your help. You're welcome. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You will hear a talk on a social history of the East End of London. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at various aspects of the social history of London. And this morning, we're continuing with a look at life in the area called the East End. I'll start with a brief history of the district and then focus on life in the first half of the 20th century. Back in the 1st to the 4th centuries AD, when the Romans controlled England, London grew into a town of 45,000 people, and what's now the East End, the area by the River Thames and along the road heading northeast from London to the coast, consisted of farmland with crops and livestock, which helped to feed that population. The Romans left in 410, at the beginning of the 5th century, and from then onwards, the country suffered a series of invasions by tribes from present-day Germany and Denmark, the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, many of whom settled in the East End. The technology they introduced meant that metal and leather goods were produced there for the first time, and as the East End was by the river, ships could transport goods between there and foreign markets. In the 11th century, in 1066 to be precise, the Normans conquered England, and during the next few centuries London became one of the most powerful and prosperous cities in Europe. The East End benefited from this, and because there were fewer restrictions there than in the city itself, plenty of newcomers settled there from abroad, bringing their skills as workers, merchants or moneylenders during the next few hundred years. In the 16th century, the first dock was dug, where ships were constructed, eventually making the East End the focus of massive international trade. And in the late 16th century, when much of the rest of England was suffering economically, a lot of agricultural workers came to the East End to look for alternative work. In the 17th century, the East End was still a series of separate, semi-rural settlements. There was a shortage of accommodation, so marshland was drained and built on to house the large numbers of people now living there. By the 19th century, London was the busiest port in the world, and this became the main source of employment in the East End. Those who could afford to live in more pleasant surroundings moved out, and the area became one where the vast majority of people lived in extreme poverty and suffered from appalling sanitary conditions. That brief outline takes us to the beginning of the 20th century, and now we'll turn to housing. At the beginning of the century, living conditions for the majority of working people in East London were very basic indeed. Houses were crowded closely together, and usually very badly built, because there was no regulation. But the poor and needy were attracted by the possibility of work, and they had to be housed. It was the availability rather than the condition of the housing that was the major concern for tenants and landlords alike. Few houses had electricity at this time, so other sources of power were used, like coal for the fires which heated perhaps just one room. Of course, the smoke from these contributed a great deal to the air pollution for which London used to be famous. A tiny, damp, unhealthy house like this might well be occupied by two full families, possibly including several children, grandparents, aunts and uncles. Now, before I go on to health implications of this way of life, I'll say something about food and nutrition.
That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. The ILTS. General training writing test often feels like a hurdle, especially the letter writing task. But fear not, intrepid English explorer. Mastering this skill is entirely achievable. Whether you're applying for a job, enrolling in a course, or simply communicating, a well-crafted letter can be your greatest ally. So grab your metaphorical pen and let's embark on this journey to conquer the ILTS GT letter writing task together. Imagine receiving two invitations, one a handwritten note on colourful paper, the other a crisp card with elegant calligraphy. Both invite you to a party, but the tone is completely different. Formal letters are like wearing a suit for official purposes, like job applications or complaints. Informal letters are more like jeans and a t-shirt for personal communication with friends or family. So before you start writing, ask yourself, who am I writing to and what is my purpose? Writing a formal letter can feel like navigating a minefield of etiquette. But it doesn't have to be daunting. Follow these steps to craft a letter that commands attention and respect. First, your address and date. Begin with your address at the top right corner, followed by the date. Next, the recipient's address. On the left side, write the recipient's name and address. If you don't have a specific name, use their title and department. Then the salutation. Use a formal salutation like Dear Sir Madam or Dear Mr. Ms. last name, followed by a colon. State the purpose of your letter clearly and concisely. Develop your points in separate paragraphs, providing specific details and supporting evidence. In the closing paragraph, summarize your main points and state your desired outcome. End with yours faithfully, if you don't know the recipient's name, or yours sincerely, if you do, followed by your signature and type name. Remember, Clarity and conciseness are key in formal letters. Avoid using overly complex sentences or jargon that your recipient may not understand. Writing an informal letter is like chatting with a friend on paper. You can relax the formality and let your personality shine through. Here's how to strike the right balance between friendly and appropriate. First, your address and date. Similar to formal letters, start with your address at the top right corner, followed by the date. Use a warm and friendly greeting like dear first name or high name. Start with a personal touch like asking about their well-being or mentioning a shared experience. Share your news, thoughts or experiences in a conversational tone. Wrap up your letter with a friendly closing remark and express your desire to stay in touch. End with a casual closing like best regards, warmly or love, followed by your first name. I Let's put our newfound knowledge into practice with some example letters. First, a formal letter example. Complaint about a faulty product. Date. Customer service manager's name title. Company name. Company address. Dear Sir Madam, I am writing to express my dissatisfaction with the product name that I purchased on date of purchase from your store location website. Upon opening the package, I discovered that the product name was damaged. I have attached photographs as evidence of the faulty product. I request a full refund or a replacement for the damaged product. I look forward to your prompt response and resolution to this matter. Yours faithfully, your name. Now that you've mastered the art of formal and informal letters, 
Let's unlock the secrets to scoring high on the ILTS writing test. Address all parts of the task prompt and fulfill the requirements of the letter. Pay close attention to the word count and aim for at least 150 words. Organize your ideas logically and use appropriate linking words and phrases to ensure a smooth flow of information. Showcase your vocabulary range by using a variety of words and phrases accurately. Use a variety of grammatical structures correctly. Pay attention to subject-verb agreement, tense consistency and punctuation. Allocate your time wisely, spending about 20 minutes on the letter writing task. Leave some time for proofreading and editing. As we reach the end of our letter writing adventure, remember that the key to success is practice. The more you familiarize yourself with different